Um, so one of the reviews I read uh, about Seminar when it was on Broadway, I think it was from Variety, if I remember correctly, is they talk about how uh, the, the critic actually mentions how he didn't think Teresa Rebic went far enough in the commentary about the kind of the world of publishing or, or really take it into any form of art form. And it kind of, she goes into the, the teacher sleeping with the students and the students sleeping with each other. And just as we've read through it, like, would you have preferred if she went a little bit deeper into some of the comments that they do make, whether it's about Leonard being jaded about the publishing world or using Douglas's name to get in. Like they hint at some deeper things, but she never really dives fully into it. I don't really think diving further into that specificity would make it as accessible to the audience. Cause that's such a, not everyone's in the publishing world. Like maybe they would get too hung up on that to identify with. Versus, like, if you look at the standard tropes that were presented, however they play out, I think it makes it more like, oh, I've seen this person, I've felt like this person, regardless which of the characters that person was, you know? Mm -hmm. You're like, oh, I know girls like Izzy and feel some type of way about it. Or, oh, I am Izzy and feel some type of way about it. Or or mm -hmm. then even in even in the way that, Leonard suggests that Douglas goes off to Hollywood. Like, you're not going to be taken seriously as a writer. No one cares what you have to say. You're good in Hollywood. You know, mm -hmm. like how many of us as actors have been told or placed in boxes like, oh, go do sitcoms. You're perfect for sitcoms. <laughs> go do, you know, certain types of things or, oh, you'll never be the leading lady. Like, you'll be only the funny sidekick. Um, uh, but, you know, it's, it's that sort of thing mm -hmm. where th maybe they're not wrong, <laughs> but also it's, it's sticking people in that box and it's, it's right. universal outside of the publishing world as well. Yeah, I feel like if she were to delve into either one of those topics, <sighs> it would have then become a play about this thing or about that thing, as opposed to a play about all of these different things. Yeah. Um, so it would have had, you know, maybe more focus, but then it would have lost, you know, different aspects that kind of, I think, rounded out in a way. Yeah, I think that's true. It does because it doesn't go, it touches on so many things that are all just kind of intertwined within, within this, this world, but that have a lot of relatable things. But um, trying to imagine how it would go deeper, I, I mean, I feel like in a, in a sense like this where we're seeing these little uh, sort of weekly study groups kind of things like it, it I, I mean I just feel like it would have to be more monologues like emotional sort of monologues like Leonard kind of has at the end where he's telling you about the long like the the full arc of his career and everything that's happened mm -hmm. and I think that was that's probably like the longest kind of thing like that but again about the speech and about how it goes everything else is so natural and there are large chunks of text, but they're, but it clips so much. They're talking so much about different things that it doesn't feel like, and now a monologue to tell you exactly how I feel about a, you know, it's not as presentational as that. It's so much more natural as it is in our world, in our own little conversations that unless it was a therapy session that we were sitting in to watch, I don't know how you would get that deeper emotional content in the same like natural language context that we've, that she's created so well there. I, I agree with the general consensus that like this is not so much about the industry it's more about the politics of an industry um I do think I mean and I by no means like I didn't study English but I I always I, I kind of take the stance whenever there's a subject matter that's supposed to have like expertise around it like just commit to it don't boil don't, don't water it down for the viewer so a lot of what a lot of Leonard's feedback toward them I, I totally agree. It's like very well, like natural language, but I'm trying, I'm thinking back to like feedback that professors may have given me, like they, they wouldn't be so vague, like, oh, it just has like this deliciousness about it. Like, give us some, give us, what are, what are some specific, uh, and they mentioned like the schools and they mentioned some of the publishers, but like, what are, other than like Dickin, Dickinson, Emily Dickinson, like, by gosh, like, please give us someone other than her and Rushdie, like everyone knows them. 
I would have been, I would have appreciated a, a few more specific touchstones, like to make it a little bit more like these are experts. Like these people are very, very, these people went to freaking masters of fine arts for their, their craft. I think that's maybe where they could have leaned in a little deeper, not necessarily like give it a whole monologue, just those, those small, just like the little things. And maybe perhaps that can be conveyed, you know, we're also limited via Zoom, that perhaps that could be conveyed in a set or in props or something, but. Right, it says something about the, kind of what we're talking about, like how deep the play goes into it, when it's a group of writers and we never actually hear any of their writing. Like the yeah. That I that's just that's exactly like I hated girl like the TV show girls for that I'm like oh yes we're supposed to believe that Lena Dunham is just like this pinnacle of creative works of fiction by women and they give us samples and it's like the most basic so I think when you're writing about an expertise particularly anything that's yeah poetry writing playwriting whatever there's almost like a, a fear like I have to write something that is even better than the 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 shell that it's living in like I don't know. Yeah. No, definitely. I think that's a good point. Because you're right, like, when the only writers you hear about are Kerouac, Dickinson, and Rushdie, like, you know, you're not appealing to, a, you're not appealing to those who are super into the literary world. It's a lot of names that people recognize or something like On the Road, where it's like, even if you haven't read it, you know, kind yeah, of. They're not, they're not even like insider jokes about mm -hmm. the writers. They're very right. well known. Because as a viewer, that might be, I guess you're saying, like, that might be good. Like, I'm not a literary expert, so if I don't know what they're talking about, I would expect to feel that way at times. Like, wow, they must really know their shit. I don't know what they're talking about, you know? Like, mm. that might give it that sense of um, sort of expertise or elitist, uh, insider, kind of whatever. Sure, that makes sense. I, on the subject of, like, going deeper or whatever, or was it just right? I kind of, I wished that we had more of a glimpse into their outside lot. Maybe, maybe this is the wrong word, but I always, when I'm watching plays, I always kind of ask that pass, I think it's the Passover question, what, what makes tonight different than most nights and I love seeing that one inciting incident of oh if that character hadn't said that one thing we wouldn't all be sitting here for 90 minutes watching this play and I think the thing about seminar was what made tonight different was they all walked into a seminar together which was fine but to me the arc kind of felt glossed over of in the time frame of these what was it four weeks that they ended up spending together mm -hmm. and I think I would have liked getting more in depth of who what was going on outside of the seminar and they did allude to that with Martin and Izzy and everybody but and then how that changed them as writers because I think I think what makes people great writers and artists are bringing their own lives into it I, like Leonard said to, to, to Kate you can't write because you're a white girl who hasn't experienced stuff but I don't know if if we're looking for depth that's kind of what I was missing well that's sorry that's a tangent no, but that's interesting to think then, too, about Kate's journey as a writer at a certain point. Like, she pretends she's totally someone else with a different experience and background, and that is then applauded by the rest of the cast. Like, oh, this is such good writing. And she's like, oh, yeah, well, that was me. You're right. You know, um, the only way that anyone would take her seriously was if she was totally someone else. She wrote for her audience of one to like, she wrote <laughs> one letter. Yeah. <laughs> exactly what she knew he wanted to read. And that's how she kind of like cracked the, the ceiling or whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah, then, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say that this is a, a play that I feel 
it could have gone so many different ways, you know, just with with its setup and its characters. It could have, you know, branched off into so many different directions as far as like where it would end. And uh, I can't decide if that's commendable or uh, or a, a flaw. You know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. Cause you would, I guess you would think like with, with really like well-defined characters and motives and stuff, like it can really only go a certain way or is it laudable that, you know, you could see it going a bunch of different ways and this is just the way it happened to go. Um, yeah. I don't know. The universe is full of intimate or uh, a number of possibilities just because it's written down doesn't change that. True. Mm -hmm. Did, on that note, did you find, though there was potential for them to go in different directions, were you or anyone surprised or disappointed in the trajectory their character or any character took? Are we allowed to ask questions? I was, of course, yeah. No, please, ask away. <laughs> this is a discussion portion. Like, any, any and everything is allowed. Um, I mean, I think the only one who really is allowed to kind of at least in my mind, the, to surprise you is Kate, because when at the wrap up, when Martin is at Leonard's house and she walks out the door, like, that is, she walks out of his bedroom, there's the moment of just this reveal, and it's, it's the moment where you, I think you get to see her as the most well-rounded character, as someone who can write, you know, the, the Jane Austen-style novel, and she can write the transvestite cubano gang leader and she can also be that kind of sexy flirtatious person that izzy portrays so you have this you know you really have the character of kate who can play all of these uh tropes that they that she puts out you know well and it's interesting on that note that as a commentary in the text she says, um, but it's not okay when I do it, or it's surprising when I do it, you know, the same thing that Izzy was doing. And Martin says, yeah, but you're smart. It's like, like as a society, you can only be so many of these things. Like we can't mm -hmm. function thinking that anyone can be more than one trope. Mm -hmm. But this character, even though she's fallen by the wayside as we all feel, um, and the men kind of take the lead, she still is all of these things and that is the only like wow moment um openly that the other comments like the other characters comment on saying like you, you but you can't be that because you're smart you can mm. sleep with people and know about it you're smart you can you know that's so in a way the playwright kind of cultivates the same point of view that the other characters do have of kate and so in that way like for me i like yes Kate is a complex human with specific choices and she can be a sexual goddess in her own way. Um, but I did find, I was, I don't want to say disappointed, but I would have liked more inklings of her, like the, the bigger than the trope Kate. Um, Cause it felt like the writing of her was to feed that, like that basic narrative. So when it, when it came time, it was like, I was like, Oh, I'm kind of sad that that's that that's what we've reduced this character to is like she's having to like whatever make this mm. twist but also because I didn't know enough about her like I think I have a much better understanding of Leonard and of Martin and even of Izzy in terms of consistency but Kate it's like we we were given a very shallow narrative of of what her what her motivation motivations or true motives were and then so that that choice felt like oh okay well in the larger context of the play sure like she she can be that too but with the like just looking at her through the like you know mm -hmm. walking hand through the play I was like okay she's a little she was a little it was a little bit like Sandra D it was a little bit of grease like yeah in four weeks you <laughs> we were just like the leather pants was like tell me about it <laughs> you, you have this hiding in you all along really. Mm. Yes, I have always. The moral of this story is what? Okay, a little bit of that I see. Okay, that makes sense. And she was the only character I had that with. Like I, I felt pretty. I felt comfortable with. I mean, also I had a vested interest, but. Yeah. 
Well, I think that's a fair, I think that's a fair assessment. Like when you, you know, the things we know about all of these characters, you can kind of list on one hand and with Kate, like she does kind of get the short end of the stick of like interesting facts about her. It's like she lives in a very fancy apartment that her family owns practically. She writes Jane Austen style novels, but also loves cookie dough and Chinese food. Yeah, that was such a funny thing. She's, she belongs the right Chinese food is delicious, though. <laughs> I love the comment where he's like, I can't believe girls actually eat that. Like, <laughs> when she's eating the cookie dough. I'm just your manic pixie dream girl. Yeah. <laughs> Let's have a pillow fight. <laughs> it's so funny. But also, cookie dough is delicious. It is. Yeah, I feel like Martin is just extremely sheltered in many ways and he he one one like commendable thing about him i think is that he does have like a set of you know morals that are you know just the way he thinks things should be but he ends up just being battered and destroyed by his own set of morals and the fact that that the world he lives in doesn't live up to his own set of morals and so he ends up like basically just scrounging um on the ground because of you know his own beliefs really yeah yeah and then i i would like to ask i asked this uh before we uh started recording the discussion while uh people had stepped away but i had asked courtney um because i thought she was uh not able to stay but since she is i'm gonna ask it again um I know Courtney and Dan, you had both commented that you were really drawn to these specific characters as characters you would like to play and read. And I just, I'm curious as to why, like what draws you to them? What, like why? And especially like Dan, like you love Alan Rickman. Why didn't you want to play that character? Like why Martin then for you? I mean, it's a great character choice, but also why? Um, I guess just, uh... Personally, I mean, to be honest, I didn't remember all that much about the play itself. I just knew that, um, well, I guess, I guess just, I didn't want to do Leonard. I don't know. Uh, I, I didn't want to, I wouldn't want to fall into any sort of, um, you know, way of doing it. Like I didn't, re I couldn't really remember the way that uh, Ham Hamish Linklater you know, did the role when I saw it. So I wasn't going to be at risk of like falling into any sort of replication. Whereas I can pretty well remember, you know, the way that Alan Rickman did the role. And Martin's just a part that I am more close to being, you know, able to actually perform. So I tend to want to just do, do read parts like that when it's, when it's possible. Um, and I just remember the play being well written, and I thought that that the the part would be just fun, fun to read. That's really the extent of it. <laughs> you don't want to find yourself doing an Alan Rickman impersonation, is it? <laughs> Not tonight. <laughs> Another time. <laughs> oh, we should close this with everybody picking a line and then trying to say it like Alan Rickman. <laughs> <laughs> really, the, the one line that I really remember uh, him saying specifically was the one where he's talking about um sucking on my balls so hard i'm seeing stars like that really just is in my memory forever oh, that's my childhood like, it's nothing i ever wanted to hear him say but um he said it did he play it with a british accent or an american accent like, he, he did a Brit, his own his own okay, accent yeah, sorry, yeah. Mm -hmm. well it's always a, it's also such a interesting uh like way that that run went on Broadway because it went from Alan Rickman playing the role to I think Jeff Goldblum. Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> yeah. And I just remember thinking like such very specific line readings for both of these guys. I can't imagine trying to change over for the actors of like okay I'm working with Alan Rickman to going in and going like all right now I'm working with Jeff Goldblum. Jeff Goldblum <laughs> definitely like sits in like the archetypal version of how I imagine Leonard like he's got enough can lean into the creepy enough. Alan Rickman would have brought, I think, a, well, I, I didn't see it, but I, I would have been interested to see how he took it. They, they did, uh, I, I didn't get a chance to see it with uh, Goldman, but I got a, I did get the chance, like, Dan, to see it with Rick, Alan Rickman, and I was 
he he brought a uh it was creepy but it was also like there was a level to him where i was like oh you're dignified this is kind of nice and then all of a sudden he reaches over and like brushes and sniffs izzy's hair and i'm like yeah now we've 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 crossed we've crossed over the rubicon now it's creepy <laughs> yeah that's the if thing anyone touches and brushes your hair that's weird that's like on the borderline of that show you on netflix mm-hmm. ain't nobody got time <laughs> <laughs> that's that's another thing that bothers me that does bother me about this play like leonard is a shit you know he's a he's a shit in my opinion and you know he's really central to the play obviously and and becomes a person who you're supposed to be invested in by the end and maybe even feel sorry for so uh, and i just personally have a hard time feeling any sort of sympathy yeah. for this for this character because he's so blatantly the, I, I mean he uh, we we've identified that everyone's kind of a trope every, each character but like from the get go he's such a specific just like douchebag <laughs> you know it's like he's almost like so over the top um in the beginning and yeah you, you know like you're saying you you're supposed to almost feel sorry for him or something right or or i mean you're supposed to root for him and martin to be successful and work together i don't know if you're supposed to feel that yeah we're, we're trying to think that like and everything was happily ever after but but maybe that's not necessarily what she's saying she's just saying that's and this is how it goes or and this is what happened mm-hmm. but um mm-hmm. Yeah, it is kind of hard to find him redeeming at any point because he's so brazen with it all. Reminds me of so many professors that I had. And uh, the other thing is, like, we're looking at all these characters like, oh, yeah, they're flawed. And we can see that he's a jackass, but we don't necessarily see the break in his humanity necessarily. So it's like we're seeing, we all get to experience Leonard with that sense of authority, like, with that a sense of expertise. And he has, like, his inflated ego is almost justified in our mind. And, I, yeah, I really wanted at the end, I would have loved to see like, just, you know, not Leonard, but just, you know, Leonard, like what's, what, what are his, mm-hmm. what, are, what are his like insecurities or, I mean, we, we get a hint of it, but um, I know he's just, you could, you can, you can, you can just cast, you can cast the shit out of him. Like you, you, we know, we know exactly the type of person he's supposed to be. And you did an excellent job, by the way. I really enjoyed that very much. Got the, well, it was fun to read. I didn't know what I was about to say next most of the time. Wow, what did I just say? Wow, okay. Fun. Like mm-hmm. literally 100%. I was like, who was this man's name? And I was like, oh, Jacob? Okay. <laughs> he is amazing. <laughs> I never break the fourth wall, but when you said something and I was, I laughed, somebody put me on mute. <laughs> I, <started> <laughs> I think it was pussy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was like, oh my god, Thank you so much. Yeah, I don't know if uh, I agree with you, Jacob. I don't know if uh, Rebecca was really going for like a happy ending at the end as much as like I, I like to believe that with Leonard helping Martin, even though there's a give and take to it, like he we see so much, and she draws parallels very much so between Leonard and Martin from the way that they talk about the work to the way they feel about everybody's writing to the way that they drop the pages as they finish reading them. Like yeah. she's very much claw, uh, drawing the parallel between these two characters. And so I, I'd like to think that even though it's not like a redemption arc at the end, hopefully with Leonard helping him, Martin won't become who Leonard is now. Like right. the, one of those do as I say, not as I do situations, because Leonard has clearly become so jaded about the whole process that like he can't write yeah i think he even says at the end like i have no skin anymore i can't show my work to people because it it hurts when people read it so he's i think he's hoping to work with martin to not lead him down that path and they'll probably be successful together even though oh, 100 uh one one thousand percent i think she's very clear that like Martin's a great writer and Leonard for all of his like terrible habits is very good at what he does. Well, it's interesting too, like how it alludes that, you know, Leonard's going to go home and not care. And he says coldly to Kate when she tries to drop out and he's like, I don't care. Like, Oh, boo hoo. Like no one cares. Meanwhile, he went home and on his own time edited Martin's 
paper, like edited mm -hmm. the beginnings of the novel for him without anyone asking or saying. And was like, I did this, there you go. Like on his own time, that wasn't during the time that the class had paid him for it. You know, it's the equivalent of any of our teachers finding scenes or monologues or any of this stuff outside of the few hours that we're in class together, you know, it's, it's all that extra work that shows that they do care about us succeeding or doing well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And that's like the only really redeeming part about Leonard is that he, it's a glimpse of not only is he nervous himself to show and share his writing with the world as Martin was, he does secretly care. <laughs> like, Yeah, definitely. Um, so with all that being said, uh, any last thoughts or comments on the, on the play as we wrap up our discussion? Another good choice, organizers. Uh, yay! Thank you guys. Thank you all for, uh, for being a part of it and, and coming through. We really appreciate it. Um, Dan, Brooke, Jacob, thank you guys for, for coming and, being, and reading for the first time. We hope to see you guys again. Uh, yeah, as I'm sure all of you know, keep your eyes out for the Caspel NYC emails. Uh, we'll have the the next play readings coming up. We have the monologue battle that we'll be posting on Instagram pretty soon. And uh, starting on October 1st, we're going to send out a monologue challenge. It's going to be like a monthly challenge with uh, a prompt for everybody to pick your own monologue to do. Um, this next one coming up is going to be your first audition monologue. So the first monologue you auditioned with from. <laughs> oh, that's what you're doing. Oh, yeah. right? So you just want to be triggering, huh? That's what you want to do. It will, it'll be such a fun exercise. One, to dust it off. Two, to realize what were you thinking and like what you chose for yourself then. Are we, how far back are we going? Cause my. Whatever you want. Okay, my first model was like I was like nine. I'm like I don't know if I want to do that. <laughs> uh, you can do you can do your first monologue from when you were nine if you'd like. You can do from your first uh, New York audition or your college or high school audition. Um, Whatever like, one you can remember to find, in my opinion, like exactly, I don't yeah. Any monologue I did. Prior Mine's to gonna college. be from Finding Nemo, so I just wanted y'all to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that I sounds amazing. What monologue you're doing? Is it the one where Dory's like? P thirty six. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So like, what so monologues are there? <laughs> <laughs> no, Dory did it. She killed that shit. <laughs> but I think it'll be really funny um, to see the choices prior to really like knowing better on one hand what yeah. you yeah. should and shouldn't do. And then also when you revisit a piece, however long before it was, you know, like visiting it now knowing what you know now, like what you would kind of do differently to it, whether mm -hmm. it's appropriate for you now or not. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> mine, then. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's a funny, it's a funny exercise. So it's cool. And then the biweekly battles are also really fun because it's so many. Um, the idea is that we send out the monologue and then people record it and send it back to us, having not seen the other actors doing the same one. So it's like your own take and spin and interpretation of it. And then you can see how other people might have done that exact thing. Like, I don't, I don't know, like whenever you're like waiting to go into an audition and you all have the same sides or you right. hear <laughs> someone singing the same song that you were going to sing, like how to, I don't know, let that go in that sense. So this is kind of that without hearing them on the other side, like, yeah, I, I think it's cool to compare the different the different ways that people do things. Very cool. So. Awesome, guys. Well, thank you all so much for being a part of this. We really appreciate it. Um, keep a lookout for the video. We'll be posting probably early next week uh, the discussion on YouTube and on Instagram. And, and yeah, that's it. Thank you guys again. We will see you all soon. If y'all want to hang out and keep chatting, uh, as long as Amanda's here, the room will be open.